sulfuric and nitric acids are both very corrosive liquids. Fuming nitric acid is even more dangerous and will set your lab gloves on fire if you spill it. Hydrazine is very, very poisonous liquid. This video is for educational purposes and is not meant to be recreated unless you are a professional chemist. Ok, with all those warnings on everything that could go wrong with the reactions, let's get to the fun part. As weird as it sounds, I am finally synthesizing something useful and that's the Bredis reagent. This compound in its pure form is solid with really nice red crystals. Even today when we have things like NMR spectroscopy or gas chromatography, this compound is still used as a quick way to determine if you have an aldehyde or ketone in your sample. It reacts very fast with those compounds forming yellow to red colored precipitates. If you isolate the product, you could go even farther and determine the structure of the analyzed carbonyl compound by measuring the melting point of its precipitate with the Bradys reagent. Since these precipitates are non-soluble, easy to isolate, stable solids, a lot of them have their melting points described in the literature. For this synthesis we are going to use the chlorobenzene, which I made in my previous video by chlorinating some benzene. Firstly, I am going to nitrate it, not just once, but twice, to get the 2,4 dinitrochlorobenzene. Then the chlorine atom is going to be replaced by a hydrazine group to yield 2,4 dinitrophenylhydrazine, which is essentially the Bradys reagent. Since I am going to do a double nitration in one step, concentrated nitric acid will not be enough. We need something more powerful. Meet fuming nitric acid. Unlike the normal concentrated stuff, which is only 68%, the rest being water, fuming nitric acid is basically 100% pure nitric acid. Mine has a bit yellow color because it is not very stable and decomposes by light, liberating some nitrogen dioxide, which covers it. And guess why it's called fuming? Oh, yes, because it fumes. And I'm serious, if this spills on your gloves, it will set them on fire. I measured out 22 grams of the acid. This was followed by measuring out 44 grams of sulfuric acid. Our next goal is to mix these two, and as you might expect, this mixing is very exothermic. Remember when the chemistry teacher always said not to add water to the acid? Well, let's follow this rule and instead of water, just add another acid to the acid. Thanks to the ice bath and my slow addition, everything went perfect and under control. The mixture I just made is called nitration mixture because it's used to nitrate all kinds of stuff like toluene, phenol or glycerol. When the nitration mixture cooled below 10 degrees Celsius, I started adding the chlorobenzene dropwise. The addition resulted in sudden spike in the temperature and using a nice bath for this reaction was absolutely mandatory, because the temperature should never rise above 40 C. If that happens, Trinitrous products will form, which I am pretty sure your imagination is great enough to get an idea what would happen. In total, I added 13.5 grams of chlorobenzene, which took me about 10 minutes. Now I have to heat the mixture on an oil bath to 90 degrees Celsius for 2 hours. At first, I tried to do it in my Erlenmeyer flask, however, I soon realized where this was going. The reaction would produce tons of toxin fumes filling my lab, so I transferred everything in a ground glass joint 100ml round bottom flask, on top of which I could equip a condenser. What's happening here is that sulfuric acid initially protonates the nitric acid. The protonated nitric acid then easily liberates water and becomes a nitronium ion which itself is an electrophile. It attacks the aromatic ring forming a complex which after liberation of a hydrogen ion becomes a nitro compound. This step is repeated to get dinitrochlorobenzene. 
Since the chlorine atom increases the electron density, mostly at ortho and para positions, the nitration occurs on these places and not on the metal ones resulting in 2,4 dinitrochlorobenzene. The heavier colorless bottom layer were the acids and the upper yellow layer was our dinitrated product. I separated the layers in kind of a lazy way by just sucking the lower layer with a pipette. Then I poured the organic layer in 300 ml of distilled water. 2,4 dinitrochlorobenzene is solid at room temperature, so I honestly was kind of disappointed when nothing precipitated out. Instead, an unstable emulsion formed, which immediately separated when I stopped the stirring. The lack of solidification, however, gives us a unique opportunity to wash the product from any remaining acid. So I quickly decanted off the water to another beaker and replaced it with an next dose of about 150 milliliters. The steering was again turned on to mix well the two liquids and then the water was decanted. This operation was repeated one more time to wash off any traces of the acid. Then I placed the beaker in cold water and turned on the steering. After a minute later, all the nitrochlorobenzene instantly solidified trapping the steer bar inside and not allowing it to spin. And since the magnet of my hot plate was pretty powerful, it started spinning the whole beaker instead. So yeah, if you can stir the solution, just stir the beaker. Now that I have a solid, I suction filtered it through my Buchner funnel and washed it a few more times with distilled water. Then I allowed it to dry on the pump for a few minutes. Here is how my product looked like. This yellow tint is its natural color. Actually, almost all nitro compounds have yellow color. Without allowing it to dry or measuring it, I quickly proceeded to the next reaction. I put all of the product in 250ml round bottom flask. Then I added 200ml of 95% ethanol. The idea here is to dissolve the dinitrochlorobenzene in the ethanol. However, even after a long stirring, it didn't dissolve completely so I decided to heat it with my heat gun. This worked really well, however it raised the temperature to 50 degrees and the next reaction should be carried out below 20, so I cooled the solution in an ice bath. This is my hydrazine hydrate. Unlike ammonia, it is very toxic compound and should be handled with great care. Unfortunately, when the temperature fell below 30 degrees, some of the dinitrochlorobenzene started to crystallize out. Nevertheless, I waited until it cooled below 20 and then I started to add the hydrazine dropwise. As soon as it touched the surface, a dark color started to form. This is actually the Brady's reagent, which was even more evident later when it turned all red. The reaction wasn't exothermic at all, which honestly for me was very relieving. In terms of reaction, what's happening here is that the chlorine atom from the aromatic ring is being replaced with a hydrazine group. Normally, halogens that are bound to an aromatic ring are very difficult to substitute. However, in this case, we have two nitro groups in the ring, which favors this reaction. In the end, we get our desired 2,4 dinitrophenylhydrazine. When the addition was completed, I removed the ice bath and replaced it with an oil one. The mixture is now heated to 90 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes to drive the reaction to completion. The color became even more reddish and I should say that this reaction was one of the most beautiful synthesis I have ever done. When the heating time was over, I had to cool the flask once again to lower the solubility of the Bradish reagent in the ethanol. At this point, I felt like half of the time during this synthesis I just changed oil and ice baths. Anyway, I filtered the precipitate, which as weird as it was, now turned orange. 
it was broken up and washed with a bit of ethanol. Then it was dried on the vacuum pump for several minutes. To purify this compound I need to recrystallize it. And since the Bradys reagent is such a tedious compound, it requires not a common solvent like water or ethanol, but a kind of exotic one. This is one butanol. I wouldn't hate it so much if it wasn't for its smell. It really smells so full, kind of like a mixture of vomit and pain cleaner. Well, at least it is not toxic. I poured about 300 milliliters of the butanol in 800 milliliters beaker and turned on the heating. Then I started adding the Brady's reagent in small portions, waiting it for all to dissolve before adding more. There is actually an alternative to 1-butanol as a solvent and that's dioxine. However, that is even more expensive and hard to get and my lab is on tight budget. That's why you should subscribe to my channel. By subscribing you support my channel so I can buy more interesting stuff and make even better videos. Oh, and don't forget to turn the notifications bell on. Back to the recrystallization. Soon enough, no more Bradys reagent was dissolving, so I added a little more butanol to dissolve that last portion. Then I removed the beaker from the hot plate. I noticed that on the bottom of the solution there were tiny undissolved particles. To get rid of those, I decanted the solution in another beaker. To get bigger and beautiful crystals, I wrapped the beaker in aluminum foil and let it cool slowly overnight. In the morning, a really nice red needles had formed. I broke them up by shaking the solution and then carried out a vacuum filtration. The crystals were transferred to a glass plate and allowed to air dry for a day. A note should be made here that the Brady's reagent can detonate by heat or friction when dry. It is best stored as a solution or wet. After all, when you use it, you need a solution of it. I'm letting it dry here because I want to demonstrate how the pure compound looks like. And as you can see, its crystals are very nice, beautiful and red. I didn't have enough butanol to do the recrystallization at once, so I had to repeat it 3 more times. This is the rest of the product. My yield was 16.5 grams, which corresponds to a percent yield of 69.5. This is not bad and 16.5 grams are probably gonna be a lifetime supply for me from this reagent. So I was pretty happy with the result. Now it's time for some analytical chemistry. To start off, I firstly had to prepare solution of the Bradys reagent in methanol. The amount you are seeing here corresponds to 0.5 grams and to it I'm adding 50 milliliters of methanol. Although I shaked it, it didn't dissolve until I added several drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. The acid also changed its color from red to yellow. However, even then the solution looked cloudy and not transparent as it should be. So I decided to filter it. A simple filter paper did the job very well and the solution became perfectly transparent. A sample of the solution was prepared in the first test tube to serve as a reference. The rest of the tubes were charged with formaldehyde, butanol, acetone, methyl ethyl ketone and acetyl acetone. After that, to every test tube I added 2 ml of methanol to dilute the sample. When everything was done, I finally placed 1 ml of the Bradys reagent solution in the formaldehyde test tube and Nothing happened. Well, let's assume that this was an accident and continue to the next sample, butanol. Adding the same amount of the reagent and there was nothing. And not only that, 
neither of my carbonyl compounds gave a precipitate. That meant that the problem was in the solution I was using. I quickly prepared a more concentrated version by adding a whole gram of the reagent to the solution and the corresponding amount of sulfuric acid needed to dissolve it. Then again, a filtration was carried out. I decided to skip the first samples and add the solution directly to the methyl ketone because I thought that this is where I have the highest chance of getting a precipitate. Initially, again, nothing seemed to happen. However, I noticed some precipitate on the test tube walls above the solution. This were very good news because when I shake the tube, a lot of crystals started to form. Ok, that's some success. Let's try the acetyl acetone. Nothing. Well, I don't think the problem here is in the Bradys reagent. Acetyl acetone is a special case of ketone because it has two carbonyl groups separated by a methylene group. Such ketones are prone to a reaction with hydrazines yielding not hydrazides but pyrazoles. The pyrazole in this case is probably soluble in the methanol, so that's why we are not seeing a precipitate. Maybe acetone will prove our theory. Yes, as in the case of methyl ketone, very fine crystals formed, which this time were slightly more yellow. Let's try butanol. F out the height. It might need some time, so let's set it aside. Now everything is in the hands, excuse me, the atoms of formaldehyde. I added the Bradys reagent to it and nothing happened. Well, you should excuse my skills in analytical chemistry. I am a man of the synthesis after all, and the old school analysis isn't what I am best in. Wait, is that a, a precipitate? Shake it. Yeah, just like that. I'm sorry if your mom was in the same room and had to hear that, but look at the sample. It is forming a precipitate. Let's try some more compounds. Ok, here we have benzaldehyde in the left and acetophenone in the right test tube. Then we have cyclopentanone and cyclohexanone. And the last one contains formic acid. Yeah, I know it's an acid, but since it contains an aldehyde group, it's worth trying, right? I added the Bradys reagent to the benzaldehyde and it instantly formed a beautiful orange precipitate. Maybe acetophenone will also work? Yep, in fact this was even cooler red colored precipitate. Cyclopentanone and cyclohexanone gave equal results and that's expected because they have relatively same structures. The formic acid unfortunately didn't react but that's ok. It means that our reagent is very selective to aldehydes and ketones. And before you say that it also didn't react with the butanol, here is its test tube. By the time I finished testing the second group compounds, it had formed a precipitate, so it turned out it just needed some more time. So that's all about the Bradys reagent. This video was a bit longer than my usual ones, so leave a comment if you prefer this format over the classic one. I hope you liked it and be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Also check out my other videos to see how I made the chlorobenzene and many other interesting compounds.